Yeah, Darren Fletcher is our special guest tonight. He's been, uh, he's been great company on and off screen, I have to say. Um, and when we're looking at that, Darren, it's, it's easy to forget sometimes. The amazing highs that you have, particularly at Manchester United, nine major honours, five league titles. Is there a, a favourite honour that you, that you look back on? Um, first, my very first season, I won the FA Cup. And I think that, um, I, I don't know, it's the first, first trophy, you know, in your first season when you played a lot of games, it looks back on a good memory. But also the first Premier League title, because I went, um, my first three seasons, we didn't win the title. So we got the Arsenal Invincibles. Then we had Jose Mourinho's Chelsea team, who took it to another level in terms of points. So my first three seasons in the first team came with no league titles, which Manchester United were all about. So there was definitely a little bit of pressure building. So to get that first one was massive. The dynamic in the dressing room and around Sir Alex Ferguson must have been really interesting at that point because he wouldn't have been used to going that long without that. It was definitely a transition in the team. It was definitely a transition in points total that it took to win the Premier League in terms of how many games you could lose. And I think that, you know, you can't... Arsenal Invincibles, you know, they went the season unbeaten, you know, that might not never happen again. Also saying that Man City could blow that out of the water. And then Chelsea took the points total to like closer to 100 points, which really was a step up. So, so Alex Ferguson and Manchester United had to rise to the challenge and, and thankfully we did. Did you talk about what you had to do differently? Yeah, we spoke about... We always spoke about ending the season well and, you know, being in a position come Christmas time. I think we realised you had to start the season well and put yourself right up there early doors. You couldn't be too far behind and we realised that you couldn't lose too many games. I think that the games of losing five and six games went... You, you could only lose one or two maximum and you had to get your points total closer to 90, you know, late 80s, pushing 100. Loads of um, Twitter questions that have come piling in for you, Darren. Uh, let's start with this one. Uh, we'll try and get through uh, as many as we possibly can before we leave you tonight. What's your favourite goal in your career? Not for quality of goal, I've scored a couple of nice volleys, but definitely for importance at a stage in my career, this one. Um, also stopped Chelsea's um, you know, unbeaten run. And... Me personally was coming under a little bit of pressure, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of stick at the time and uh, it just was a big confidence builder for me, definitely. Playing on the right wing as well, out of position and managing to get that goal, it, it meant a lot. It meant a lot for the team and it meant a lot for everyone. That, 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 I remember that game, that was on the back of the Lille game, wasn't it, when you went off the Champions League and there was the talk of Roy Keane on MUTV maybe a few weeks before. How did that affect you and the rest of the team? Because you were obviously mentioned in that situation as well. Was that why that was more important, that game? Yeah, probably. And not, not a response to Roy Keane, because Roy Keane was fantastic with me, you know, the ultimate captain, somebody who helped me more than anybody in the dressing room, gave me confidence, believed in me, probably challenged me at times, because probably wanted more from me, knew that I was capable of. So people have this thing that, you know, I got mentioned in the video, which I did, but, you know, it probably wasn't what people think it was. Roy Keane was fantastic with me and believed in me and helped me a lot. But it was just a stage where there was, you know, there was a little bit of downbeat, you know, it was a changing of the team. Chelsea, again, as I spoke about, had taken it to another level. Jose Mourinho's team were really looking powerful and strong and that stopped the run, which we felt like was maybe a little bit of a turning point and us gaining a bit of ground. Well, when you saw that, the, the actual video that, that Jamie's referring to, you said it wasn't what people thought it was. What was your reaction when you heard Roy Keane? Um, what, he said, what did he say at the time? I can't remember <laughs> word for word. Um, just, it, was, it was sort of along the lines of, you know, people in Scotland telling me how great Darren Fletcher is playing for Scotland. He's got to do that for Manchester United. He threw down a challenge to me. It wasn't necessarily was playing, you know, maybe my form at that period was better for Scotland than it was for Manchester United. But the flip side, I used to get playing for Scotland. You're not playing as well for Scotland mm. as you are for Manchester United. These things is that happen. Is free keen as well? <laughs> <laughs> so, listen, he, he laid down a challenge me, but that's all people remember. You know, for Roy Keane was fantastic. When he praised me, gave me belief. You know, he praised me constantly that people don't see. The, the nice stories about Roy Keane are the ones where he hammers people because they're the ones that people refer to him. Nobody wants to talk about Roy Keane being nice, do they? <laughs> it's not, it doesn't make so many headlines, does it? Um, <laughs> This, this is a, a, has come up in the questions as well. How did Sir Alex Ferguson manage to get the best out of you in every big game? Because certainly he seemed to play you, didn't he, in the really big games? I gained his trust in big games from a young age in terms of following instructions and maybe being given a specific job. And also maybe my style suited bigger games in terms of where winning the ball back, energy, things like that, where maybe the opposition had, you know, playing against a team who might have more of the ball. So it gave me a chance to show my 
athleticism, maybe triggering, pressing, maybe doing a job against an influential player in the team. And it started off first and foremost against Vieira in an FA Cup semi-final. And from that moment on, Alex Ferguson knew if he gave me a specific job, I would follow it out to the letter and not necessarily worry about my own performance with the ball. I would follow those instructions to the letter. And I didn't feel any pressure in the big games. I enjoyed them. That's what was at Manchester United for. I, you know, I almost like craved them. I was almost excited by them. You, you know, you talk about the job you've done on Vera. I remember that game in the semi-final. I always remember when you, you played against us, you seemed to do a job on, on Steven Gerrard at times, watching maybe with Frank Lampard. Would it be the sort of the main midfield that you were up against? Would, would you actually forget about, in some ways, you know, receiving the ball, getting on the ball, getting playing. It was all about stopping this man and almost making a, a 10 v 10 game. Yeah, sometimes I think I was probably uh, just conscious of it, so I wouldn't, I'd still try and get on the ball and make things happen, but not maybe as much as I'd usually would. I maybe wouldn't be running as far forward or maybe breaking to get into the box as much. I would also have the back of my mind that I have to match their runs into the box. You know, Frank Lampard was fantastic. At, as soon as you turned your shoulder, he went, you know, stuff mm. like that. And Sir Alex Ferguson put on my toes in the dressing room before the game. If he scores or if, if you don't match everyone who has his runs into the box, then, you know, the pressure was on me. So it's big pressure going into a game, you know, and I was <laughs> desperate to please Sir Alex Ferguson and help my teammates and follow my instructions to the letter. By the same token, though, did you not ever get frustrated? Did you not think I'm, I'm a better player than, than just stopping them? Um, no, because... I had Paul Scholes beside me and Roy Keane beside me. So very quickly you've got to realise that, yeah, you know you're a good player and you know you deserve to be at Manchester United, but you start to think to yourself, what can I bring to the team? How can I make their game easier? How can I help the team win? It was all about the team winning. It wasn't about individual honours. I knew my role in the team. I knew there was a time where I had to do a specific job that ultimately helped us win. First and foremost, it was always appreciated by Sir Alex Ferguson, which is all that mattered to me. Pleasing Sir Alex Ferguson. That's all that mattered because that got me in the team the next week. That's the only person I had to please. And secondly... My teammates recognised it as well, so I was getting respect from Ryan Giggs, Gary Neville, Paul Scholes, Roy Keane. I didn't care what anybody said to me outside the pitch. I didn't care. Twitter wasn't around then, but you know, people maybe criticised my performance. It didn't bother me because I had the greatest manager of all time, happy with my performance, knew I did the job, and also had my teammates who respected what I did. Fascinating. Um, you like the battles as well, didn't you? The individual <laughs> battles sometimes. You like putting your foot in sometimes. Have a little look at this one. <laughs> It's a good clip, this, because uh, I remember uh, Carragher getting involved. Jamie coming over and saying to me, you think you're a hard man these days, look who's coming <laughs> after me. <laughs> I remember his ex exact words were. You. Yeah. Oh, Cara. <laughs> uh, he, he actually makes a point of trying to find me, and he actually said to me, you think you're a hard man these days, so I think that's a compliment. <laughs> Another Twitter question uh, for you, Darren. Who was the toughest team you played against in the Premier League? Um, yeah, again, going back to the Arsenal Invincibles team, I thought they were fantastic. Jose Mourinho's first Chelsea team, you know, very powerful, strong, let you have the ball, punished you, you know, they were, they were like tough because they were physically tough. I think that um, the Arsenal Invincibles and them were two of the best teams I came up against, definitely. What about in Europe? Obviously, you could speak about Barcelona, but I didn't play in the finals. The one that sticks out to me is AC Milan. Um, the quartet midfield of Pirlo, Seedorf, Kaka. Kaka, before his injury, was, was, was difficult. They, they blitzed us in a, a Champions League semi-final away from home. We did well at home. We won 3-2. Went to San Siro. Gattuso, Pirlo, Seedorf and Kaka. They had a dime in the midfield. They were too good. They pressed us. We didn't expect it. We were shocked by it. We almost thought their legs had gone. They were a little bit older. We knew Kaka, you know, but Pirlo, Gattuso, Seedorf, they pressed us. They were aggressive. They outplayed us and they they thoroughly deserved a victory and it was a real wake-up call after that semi-final where you thought to yourself, we came close but we need to improve if we want to get to the final or eventually go on and win it, which thankfully we did. And what sort of emotions, when we talk about the, the sort of 2009 conclusion to the Champions League, what sort of emotions does that stir in you being part of a team that was successful at semi-final stages but then not being able to take part in the final because of your suspension? Yeah, it's something that sticks with me, really. I've managed to be on the bench twice for Champions League final, played in semi-finals. You know, I've not managed to get on the pitch in a Champions League final. It was taken away from me with a red card, which still people remember to this day. Um, you know, there was talks of appeals and stuff like that. It was never a red card. The best thing I did was speak to my dad straight after the game, and he told me to forget about it and concentrate. We still had to win the league for Manchester United. We still had Arsenal in the league, and we still had a few games to go, and he almost said, forget about the Champions League, now it's done, um, and concentrate on winning the league. But it definitely gave me a burning desire the next season 
and I think my form kept improving at that point as well but it was really with a heart and a desire to get back there and get the team back to another Champions League final and ultimately get on the pitch myself and try and win it. How hard was it watching? Well, you turn into a fan, don't you? Mm. So you're, you know, you're, you know, you're desperate for the lads to win. I thought we had a great chance in Rome. Most people speak about Barcelona and how great they were. I felt at that point they were just the beginning of it. Our people argue they had a better team at that point with Henri and Eto away, but I think we were totally outplayed in Wembley. In the Rome final, we had a chance, and in the game we started really good. They win the game, you know, comfortably two 0 but it wasn't as much of a comfortable victory as the Wembley final. And I did think in Rome we did have a chance and. One that we look back on with big regret. You know, when you, you look at that, that midfield, you obviously never came up against that, but you talk about how devastated you are watching it. Mm. But after about an hour when Iniesta and Xavi are playing, <laughs> how are you feeling then? <laughs> you go back to you, see, I became a better player by not playing that final. Because yeah. people spoke about uh, the difference I would make. And I'd like to think I was a big part of the team at that time and we changed the team for the, for the final and I'd played a lot in the semi-final against Arsenal and... It might have helped us a little bit. I know people spoke about it, but you do become a better player when you don't play and people still speak about it to today. So, you know, it might have been an even more comfortable victory if I played, <laughs> but off the back of it, people still say we would have won the final if I played, which is a nice compliment, but they yeah. were top class. Darren, do you have any regrets of leaving Manchester United? That's the next question. Right, regrets of leaving? Ooh. Is it lying, isn't it? Yes. We're, we're on now, yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought we were still off Still getting paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I was ready for it. You know, I'd had my, my spell out with illness, I'd come back. I didn't quite feel the same. You know, people said I'd never get back to playing. Um, but because I'd fought so hard to get back to playing, first and foremost, I got back to playing for Manchester United, but the club had changed. You know, we had David Moyes, we had Louis Van Gaal. I was out the team under Louis Van Gaal. I wasn't particularly enjoying it, although I learned a lot from Van Gaal. He's a fantastic manager. Um, but. For me, I was ready for a change. I wanted to play week in, week out because I'd not played for a long time and I was ready for a new challenge. You mentioned the illness. Um, I want to talk about that, if you don't mind, for, for a few minutes. Um, ulcerative colitis? Yeah. Uh, and you were explaining to me earlier, this, this is when you have a problem with your intestine and you ended up having your large intestine removed, but, but that didn't come straight away, did it? No. There was a build-up to that. So, so when the first symptoms started to show themselves and you were explaining that this, this involved regular um, visits to the bathroom that you just couldn't control mm. at that time. How much of a shock was that to you? A fit young man at the top of your game playing for one of the biggest clubs in European football and then this happened? Yeah, without a doubt, because you feel invincible. And I felt like I'm playing for Manchester United. I'm one of the first names on the, first, on the team sheet. My form's good, you know, I'm getting strong and physically, you know, working hard and, you know, my form's getting better. I'm getting physically stronger and quicker. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm flying. And at first you're a little bit blasé about it and you, you don't really respect the illness or you maybe not done enough research or really told about the implications it can have. So I was a little bit blasé and thought, you know, I'll take some tablets and it'll go away. Eventually I found out, you know, that it's more, it can get more serious than that, which it did for me. It got to the point where I couldn't control it. We tried a number of things. We tried medication, we tried alternate medicine, we tried every available thing possible, really. Um, nothing worked. We tried not playing for a while, which was when I got back to the coaching at Manchester United. We'd see if the stress of playing on my body was causing it. So eventually I had to go down the surgical route, which is last resort. You know, it's make or break. Success rate isn't high. Thankfully, I had a fantastic surgeon and I had a, a sheer determination that I was going to get back to playing. People told me I wouldn't. People prepared me for that it might not happen and don't push yourself. But the dream of playing football for me was too big to give up and I, and I was def desperate to get back. So at its worst, how often were you having to go to the toilet every day? Yeah, you know, it's it literally just blood and, you know, you're going 20, 30, 40 times a day. You know, you can't leave the house. It's, it's a horrific illness that people don't speak about, really, because of, because of the subject, because it's to do with going to the toilet. But, you know, a lot more awareness has been brought on it because of me. And people can explain that, you know, their young child, which is a lot of a lot of them say, Parents come to me and say, it's great for my, my child going to school because they say, I've got the same illness as Darren Fletcher and it makes his life easier. So that, you know, it's a humbling experience when that happened, but it just shows the power of football, really, and how far a reach it has. So how could you possibly play through any of that? Um, because my only release was being on the pitch and it, there, wasn't, there was times where I was, wasn't as sick as that, you know, where I still had, you know, s certain symptoms, but it wasn't as severe. 
And the, while I was on the pitch or while I trained, I had, you know, it, it didn't happen. I had a release from it and I felt good. So, you know, I wanted that to continue. And I just wanted to keep fighting. I just hoped that one of the medications would work. So even though I was ill and I was underweight and I was just determined to keep playing and just praying that one of the medications would work and that would trigger me, you know, rel getting it under control, dealing with it and then kicking on with my career. Unfortunately, I battled it for so long that I had no option but to go for surgery and the surgery scared me. I was frightened of it. It was, you know, it was really difficult four operations over a, a nine month period. But once I knew I was ready for it mentally, I tackled it head on and was and ready for the consequences. And again, a sheer determination to get back to playing. So really it robbed you of, of how many seasons? Three? Yeah, basically three seasons. I probably played bits and pieces of games. You know, over three seasons, I probably played maybe about 10, 12 games. Uh, at a point where I was ready to come into my prime at Manchester United. But I never looked back on it like that. I just seen it as my next challenge. And my next challenge was this was there. I didn't mump and moan about it and say, why me? Or it's cost me this or that. I just, I just met the challenge head on. I had great people around me. Alex Ferguson, you know, was there for me every step of the way. Was he? Told me not to worry about football contracts, nothing like that. Get yourself well for your family, for your wife and for your kids. You know, great parents, a great wife. You know, medical staff at Manchester United, the doc, everyone, so many people involved with the club um, were there for me and helped me. I think it, it just all adds to the fact that what you did next was all the more remarkable because, as you, as you said, you, you ended up leaving Manchester United to, went, to go to West Brom and then you played 112 successive games in the Premier League. That is extraordinary. Do you think that is one of the things that you're most proud of? I was at the time, and I remember going through the run, and people didn't, didn't think that would be possible. You know, credit to Tony Pulis as well, who believed in me, <clears throat> made me captain, played me in every game, chucked me out there when I was injured to keep that run going. But, you know, to, to play that many games in a row after what I'd been through in the Premier League, you know, I do look back and think it was a fantastic achievement. But at the time, I was just living in the moment of playing for West Brom and being captain of the team and leading by example and, self, and getting myself out there. And I spoke to the carriers before about it again. One game a week as well, you know, physically you can recover and you're, and you're ready to go again. There was maybe only a couple of times, I think once I went with a, a medial ligament in my, in my right foot where Tony basically chucked me Get out and play. Pit, get out and play. <laughs> and I'm trying to kick the ball in my left foot and, and play. But, you know, it was a challenge for me. Maybe wanted to see whether I was willing to go through the pain barrier for him in a relegation battle. Did you want to do it at the time? I didn't see how I was possibly do it, I kept saying to him, but I said I can run in straight lines and I can kick the ball with the left foot. And he said, That'll do me. That'll do me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you we worked with some big characters. This is what the next question's about. How did um, Tony Pulis's team talks differ from Sir Alex Ferguson's? Not too different. Tony Pulis is cut from the same cloth. You know, they're winners, you know, they're, they're motivators. You know, Tony Pulis is fantastic in the dressing room. They are different. Alex Ferguson's got a calmness about him and, you know, believes in his team and transcends, you know, confidence in his players. Tony Poulos makes you realise when he comes in that dressing room how important these games are, how every game matters, how much we have to be at it to get results. And he's a fantastic motivator in the dressing room and I loved working with him and all the players were motivated by him every single day and in every single team talk. It's not about mentioning Alex Ferguson. What was his, what would the team talk be like before a United game? Uh, not a United game, a Liverpool uh, United game. Would it ramp up? Would there be an extra intensity in that? And what was his main aim at getting at Jamie Carragher? Was, was there a plan there? Because it always felt like he was targeting <laughs> the weak link. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was different levels to Alex Ferguson team talks. There was ones where games he expected us to win that he basically just qu questioned us on desire and work rate. The only way this opposition team can beat you is if they want it more than you and they work harder than you. There was other times there was a tactical element. There was. A Liverpool game, obviously, talking about the atmosphere, you know, dealing with the atmosphere, dealing with Liverpool's pressure. You know, Carrows being aggressive on our strikers and trying to lay a marker, and could we exploit that? You know, we knew Carrows was going to be really aggressive, try and set a tempo. We told the strikers to expect the tackle, to expect the aggression, but could we get a bounce and could we get a ball in behind it? You know, just little things. He was a master of spotting small details in games. I always used to watch him when I was on the bench. He studied the game. He didn't get involved in what passed and what was going on here and there in the first half. He sat and studied the game, and nine times out of ten, he came in at half-time, pinpointed one or two little weaknesses in the opposition, which ultimately went on to us winning matches or, you know, one nil leads into two and three nil victories. I could speak about him all day. He's just a genius. He's a master. It was always said that you had a very special relationship with him. 
that he that you might be one of his favourites. What do you <laughs> say about that? Alex Ferguson's son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's Scottish, and that's why I'm in the team. <laughs> Listen, I owe everything to Alex Ferguson. I spoke about before how much I was willing to, you know, play from how much winning meant. He was winning, and you know about the team and what I willing to sacrifice myself, what instructions he gave me. Day to day, it wasn't like we were, you know, <laughs> father and son and talking about Scotland. It wasn't like that. You know, he knew what I was about. Low maintenance, got on with my job. He took time in speaking to the foreign players. Who, you know, he was very clever in that way. The foreign lads, you know, their family are in a different country. There's always that lure of Real Madrid, Barcelona. He knew us British lads, we only wanted to be at one club and that was Manchester United. He knew what we were about, we were reliable. The biggest thing for me was he was my manager. I listened to every word he said, he was great with me, he trusted me and I wanted to win for myself and the team and ultimately Alex Ferguson. Do you still speak to him now? I do, yeah. I still text him and um, still seek advice from him. Um, again, I can't thank him for everything in my career, not only in my footballing career, given me the chance and believe me as a young lad and hopefully I rewarded him and repaid him, sorry. But secondly, during those times of illnesses, you know, with my illness, he, he was there every step of the way for me. Phone in my house even sometimes just to speak to my wife and not necessarily me because, <clears throat> you know, I'm dealing with it. You, may be, you know, these little things that people don't see, the human side of him, which also he reflected on his teams, which is why his teams are so successful. The small details mattered and they weren't just throwaway comments, how's your family, how's this and that, he genuinely cared. Great to hear that he's, um, he's back to health as well. You must send him our, our best wishes, Darren. Um, next question, what is it like... He's not going to go on all night, incidentally. We will, we'll leave at some point. <laughs> what is it like training with um, Cristiano Ronaldo every day and how is he different to every other player? He had a mindset that he was going to be the best player in the world from day one when he came into the club. And he, he took training to another level, you know. So, so, that, you know, on that, uh, considering the success you had, the big name players you had, as soon as he came in, he had that mentality. How did that go down with the yeah. dressing room? Because that can easily be yeah. spun a different way. We talk about this hard work and training, his, his determination, but is that who's this fella? I think he is coming in when we've won leagues, European Cups in the squad. So, uh, how did you react to that? I think at first people were like, People loved it, the, the desire, but, you know, he did get stick for it, you know what I mean? And, you know, yeah, well, it's easier said than done. But, mm -hmm. it, but people respected it and liked that attitude of that mentality of I want to be the best and I want to work harder to be the best. And, you know, there was times where he was putting ankle weights on his training uh, for training and doing fast feet with ankle weights on and the lads were laughing at him, but he didn't care, didn't deter from it. And, and eventually... Ultimately, people respect it. Although lads just say it for a bit of banter, deep down they're respecting that work rate and desire and that sheer determination to be the best player in the world. And he went on and achieved it. Wasn't the only uh, great player you shared a dressing room with at Manchester United. Uh, did you ever think that the young, fresh-faced Wayne Rooney sat in the same dressing room as yourself? Fresh-faced? <laughs> well, he was when he went in, wasn't he? Just about. He's <laughs> always looked 30. <laughs> when he was 18 at the time, would become Manchester United's greatest goal scorer. Yeah, definitely. Could see that happening. Uh, Wayne was fantastic. Um, we were the two of the youngest, along with Ronaldo, youngest in the dressing room. We built up a, a good relationship very early. There was a lot of experienced winners in the dressing room, and me and Wayne, you know, we, are, we were the youngest in the team. We were close in age, we were similar backgrounds, and we just sort of, sort of got on and clicked. And you could tell that Wayne was was going to go go on and be a Manchester United great, without a shadow of doubt. The only worry was with a Real Madrid or someone come in from, because that was quite possible. But there was no doubt he was going to go on and win everything and go on and be club captain and, and end up being becoming England's all-time leading goal scorer in Manchester United. You know, what an achievement. And, and some people forget... I don't, I don't think he gets the appreciation he deserves. I think that still people don't realise how good Wayne Rooney was and, and always was in Manchester United. And again, he was a team player. He sacrificed himself at times for the greater good of the team. Should we, Jamie, be celebrating... Wayne Rooney, rather than sneering about the fact that there is this England story in a couple of weeks' time, he's going to play against the States? It's split opinion, there's no doubt about that. And I can actually see both sides of the, of the argument, really. What, what I would say is, it, Wayne, from the reports I've heard, Wayne Rooney's not starting the game. People are talking about him taking the place of someone else, could gain experience. I think he's maybe coming on for the last 15 minutes of a game. I don't think it's the biggest drama in the world or it's the biggest deal. Other countries do this and we actually, in some ways, look at it. You know, Schneider done it, Podolski. I think Ronaldo done it years after he'd uh, retired for, for Brazil. So it's happened before and you sort of look on it uh, 
as maybe something special, something a bit different, something we haven't done in this country. Now, there may be older players going back further will say, this is a nonsense, but the game's changing, the way we live in is changing, the, these things, we make more of a fuss of things now. It's not, I got a, a walk on in, in my last game for, for Liverpool. There's, there's better players than me who won their last game, probably never got nothing and just left for Liverpool, won a lot more than me and better players. But that's just the way the world is now. It's happened before in other countries. We're not the first to do it. And whether you agree with it or not, he's coming on for the last 15 minutes. He has been one of our greatest players, as you've just mentioned. I think he is underappreciated. The money's going to charity. I think everyone wins at the end of the day. Do you think he'll be excited about it? Yeah, I think so. I've spoken to him. He is excited about it. You know, I think it's fantastic. As Jamie said, it's, it's a different, you know, it's a different, you know, we are celebrating players, we should celebrate players, you know, why not, you know, we seem to be always want to put people down, let's celebrate the fact that he's England's all-time leading goal scorer, he, he's been a captain, he's been a fantastic player and money's going to charity and he's excited about it and I think it, you know, it's not going to happen all the time and it's a unique, unique moment, most capped outfield player, the extra cap's not going to take him closer to... Peter Shilton, so that's... Oh, he's not happy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's safe, you know, that's safe. That was under threat for a little while, you know. Wayne could quite easily have gone on and achieved that. So, you know, for me, he, he deserves it and I'm looking forward to seeing what if, it. What if he scores a hat-trick? <laughs> <laughs> Peter's going to be nervous about that. His previous international was against Scotland. You remember that one? I do, yeah. Um, I, it was a 3 0 defeat, but it, it, it wasn't a 3 0 game. We actually had the better chances early on in the match. And... Um, you know, England got they got their goals, took all their chances when they came. Uh, Wayne, obviously, remind, we were both captain at the time. It was a nice moment, you know, me captain in Scotland at Wembley. Obviously, the result is not what we wanted, but uh, it was a difficult night. But the performance from Scotland wasn't as bad as the raw <laughs> result reflects. <laughs> uh, well, that was one of your 80 caps for Scotland. Quite an incredible achievement, particularly what we've, we've heard tonight about the illness as well, which interrupted... Your peak years, only Kenny Dalglish uh, as an outfield player has uh, played more games for Scotland. Jim Layton too will give him a, a shout. Alex McLeish, the manager, doesn't want you to get too far ahead, clearly, <laughs> of him at the moment. How do you look back on the, that, in general terms, your Scotland career? I enjoyed every month. I never achieved what I wanted to do, which was qualify for a major tournament. I wanted 100 caps. I was desperate to get 100 caps. I didn't want to beat Kenny Dalglish, but I wanted 100 caps. They settled for 100, but the illness came in the way of that and, and different things. But I take pride in representing my country. I always went. I never pulled out. You know, I could easily have big games for Manchester United and, you know, I could have saved myself in friendly matches. I went. Whenever I was fit, and you know, I went to play for Scotland and I enjoyed every minute. I took pride in captaining the country and helping the team and giving everything. Ultimately, it didn't happen, and um, I'm disappointed by that, but I'm still a Scotland fan now, and I've not officially retired yet, so you never Ooh. know. <laughs> <laughs> the oh, door, well, the door is still open, but we'll be knocking on it as well again. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's been an absolute treat having with us tonight. Thank you so much for your, for your company, Darren. You. Best of luck for the rest of the season. We'd love to see you again. Cheers.